Everybody knows Goku, the protagonist of Dragon Ball who has always pushed his limits and fought ever stronger opponents. And after like almost 40 years, he's gotten pretty damn strong, to the point where one of the most resilient questions in the anime community is, can he beat Goku though? Anytime there's a new strong character, you'll hear it come up. And in 2018, a new competitor entered the arena. In Jujutsu Kaisen, a series about ghostly curses and the sorcerers who fight them, one man stood at the top of that world, Satoru Gojo. And in a way, you can really see him as a modern Goku, not in personality, power set, or anything that actually matters, just that now, if there's a new strong character, fans of the series come out of the woodwork asking if that character can beat Gojo. And this also includes the original Goku himself. In fact, it did become kind of popular in certain corners of the anime community to pit these two against each other. So today we're gonna go into that question, taking a look at what Gojo can do and ask the question, can he beat Goku though? Now this is a weird question to go into because what makes them strong is so completely different, because I know what a lot of you out there are thinking and I totally get it. The abilities that Gojo has at his disposal feel so overwhelming when against someone like Goku, who has mostly brute force on his side. And man, he has a lot of brute force on his side. In fact, a lot of people really underestimate how stupidly powerful Goku has become over the years, because when you really get into it, it's kind of insane. Like, I don't think I need to explain that in terms of pure physical stats, you know, speed, durability, destructive power, Goku wins. I'm pretty sure that even the people who say Gojo wins the fight know that. But just in case, I'm gonna throw it out there that in Dragon Ball Super, Goku is competing with insanely powerful characters. He was able to fight Jiren, who is capable of casually outspeeding spaceships. Spaceships in the Dragon Ball universe are often capable of traveling interstellar distances, by the way. This would require movement that is well above the speed of light. In Gojo's case, there's a few ways you can scale his speed. The most consistent way is by scaling him above Maki, who was able to fight someone moving at Mach 3, likely putting Gojo at hypersonic levels. However, some people like to scale him to massively hypersonic levels by scaling him above Kenjaku, who could react to a black hole. And in a recent chapter, we had a character named Kashimo who could blast out electromagnetic waves, which are light speed in a vacuum. Some people have used this to scale the upper echelon of Jujutsu Kaisen characters to faster than light speeds. Both of those feats are kinda weird, and I'd love to discuss them someday more in depth, but that's not really important right now. Because despite that, Gojo would still be slower than Goku in all of these cases, but we'll get more into speed later. None of this is to mention that Dragon Ball characters have been blowing up planets since Dragon Ball Z, and now we're well past universal levels since Battle of Gods, with the battle between Goku and Beerus threatening to destroy the universe and Goku getting many times stronger since then. All of this is to say that Goku is very strong. If you were to put his strength into some kind of hypothetical number, he would have a very big number. Gojo, on the other hand, does not have a very big number. In terms of sheer power, he is able to obliterate most of the special grade curses in Jujutsu Kaisen, and the weakest of that class require carpet bombings to kill, so he is many times stronger than that with the exact upper limit depending on how you scale him. His exact limit isn't super clearly defined, but we know that he likely scales well above many of the powerful attacks in the series, like the earthquake causing meteor that Jogo summons. Definitely impressive where he is, but it doesn't exist exactly stand up to what we see in Dragon Ball. But that's not really what matters. No Gojo fan thinks Gojo can brute force his way through this fight. It completely hinges on the crazy abilities that Gojo can use, and I really don't want to downplay the guy. He has some very good hacks at his disposal. So let's start with the first one that really matters to this fight, and that's Infinity, the ultimate defense of Jujutsu Kaisen. Not really a barrier, but anything dangerous that approaches Gojo continues continuously slows down, never able to actually reach its target. Although slowing down isn't quite the best way to put it, Gojo himself compares it to the Achilles and the Tortoise paradox. The paradox basically has Achilles race against a tortoise, and the tortoise has a head start. The paradox goes that Achilles must reach the tortoise before passing him, but in that time, the tortoise has gained more distance. This repeats with Achilles never able to actually reach the slower animal. Gojo's infinity is much the same way, with no matter 
matter how much distance is covered, Gojo is still not hit. And very fitting to the name, it essentially creates infinite distance so an attack can never reach. Basically simulating infinite space. This all may seem like I'm just playing around with words, but the difference really does matter in this case. Now, if you really look around, you can find a lot of abilities that counter this, from spatial attacks to mental attacks to attacks that target someone from the inside. It's not immutable, but Goku doesn't really have something like that. He's got punches, kicks, kamehameha, plus a few other tricks up his sleeve. That being said, there are a couple arguments to be made for Goku being able to get around this through sheer power, which which I should go over. You see, there's this guy named Jiren. I mentioned him earlier. He has quite a high number, big ol' power level going on, and he fights a guy named Hit. Hit has the ability to freeze people in time, like they can't move because time isn't moving for them. Anyway, Jiren moves, and then breaks the attack, and this is Jiren not going all out, with Goku being stronger than this later. And it has to be said that this isn't Jiren breaking the attack because he's stronger than Hit, like Goku did in the manga. No, it is explicitly stated that Jiren's power is above the concept of time, and through scaling, Goku's is too. At least in the case of speed. This would mean that characters on this level have infinite speed. Now, speed is determined by time and distance. You travel a certain distance in a certain amount of time. If time isn't a factor, then a character can move any distance in literally no time, so their speed is infinite. It's basically teleportation. This is what I was talking about when I said Goku is stupid powerful. He is so strong that it's just kinda dumb. Like, I feel silly saying all this, but that's just how it is. And if you think that's stupid, pick up a comic book sometime and look at some stuff The Flash has done, for example. Fiction is just fiction sometimes. It gets ridiculous. Now, why does any of that matter? Well, as established, Gojo's infinity basically makes infinite space between himself and an attack. That's the effect it simulates anyway. But if a character has infinite speed, then they can theoretically travel an infinite distance. So all of this is to say that Goku would just punch Gojo, and Gojo would die. None of this is to mention that infinity is spatial manipulation, and Dragon Ball characters have been above that stuff for a while now. You have Boo ripping a hole in space with a shout to leave the hyperbolic time chamber. Vegeta later does this, but instead of a hole, he just blows the whole thing up. Even in Dragon Ball Super Broly, the battle between Broly and Gogeta has them casually ripping through dimensional barriers. Point is, there's a decent argument to be made for Infinity not stopping Goku because spatial limitations don't seem to really apply to these guys. But I do think it's really debatable, and it really goes into the tricky area of fictional powers interacting. It gets kinda dumb like this, where there just is no basis in reality for these things, so you have to use logic to reason it out. Now before we continue, let's get in a word from this video's wonderful sponsor. Much thanks to Tokyo Tree and Sakura Co. for sponsoring today's video. Great to be sponsored, even better to get all the treats that come with it, because that's what Tokyo Treat and Sakura Co. are all about. And I have the great opportunity of sharing that with all of you, my wonderful viewers. These guys are here to bring the experience of Japan to the comfort of your own home. Tokyo Treat is all about bringing the latest, exclusive, and limited edition snacks all wrapped up in a nice seasonal theme, like their delicious ramen. And my sweet tooth is showing again because I'm a real big fan of the chocolate almond bites and the peach flavored Kit Kats. So if you're looking for some sweetness, then Tokyo Treat is the way to go, especially since each box comes with 15 to 20 snacks. Tokyo Treat also invites you to celebrate the fall season with a Mount Fuji themed box, including snacks like the Mount Fuji green tea cake. Another option to explore is a box from Sakura Co. Their boxes come with teas and snacks that are very authentic to Japanese culture, as well as special Japanese tableware like these very nice Wasaka Crane chopsticks. This month's theme is the Wonders of Saitama, not that Saitama, the city. Sakura Co. is featuring many great delicious snacks from it, like the Saitama Pear Gummies. I personally love the Milk Castella Cakes. And it all pairs wonderfully with the Sayama Tea directly from Saitama. And by getting a box from Sakura Co., you're also supporting the local Japanese businesses that make these great treats. With both boxes, you also get a really nice booklet that goes into a lot of the information about the food you receive, like the ingredients, allergens, and just some neat stuff about the culture that surrounds it. Let's celebrate the season, since that's exactly what Tokyo Treat and Sakura Co. are inviting
inviting you to do. So what can I say besides it's a great time to get one, either for yourself or it even makes a great gift. And by using the links in the description below, you can use code Zenith and get $5 off your first purchase. Honestly, I don't think it's an opportunity that you want to miss. Now let's get back to the video. That all being said, Infinity isn't all Gojo has. Another powerful ability is his domain expansion, Unlimited Void. It's a bit more complicated, but it essentially overloads a target's brain to the point where they become immobile. And honestly, this is a really solid argument against Goku. After all, Goku is pretty well known for being really weak when his guard is down. The rock to the head hasn't done his reputation any favors, and that laser he took one time really didn't do his rep any better. Or that time he takes actual damage from a normal bullet. So, solid idea. Gojo activates Infinite Void, Goku can't do anything and his guard is down, and Gojo just punches him to death. Now, this would be a phenomenal argument in Gojo's favor if it was made before Ultra Instinct was a thing. Not only is it a powerful form on its own, but it basically takes Goku's brain out of the equation when fighting. Even if his brain is overloaded, there's no reason to believe his body wouldn't continue to fight on its own. Goku would probably take damage from this as it is shown to be a move that physically hurts people, but Goku is operating at speeds that are unimaginable to Gojo. And none of this is to mention that Goku could probably just blast a hole in the domain and leave. Now, if Gojo uses this before Goku goes Ultra Instinct, then there's a solid argument for him winning the fight, but if he doesn't, then yeah, I don't think it's gonna do anything. And this leaves us to discuss Gojo's last big ace in the hole, the Hollow Technique Purple. A blast of imaginary mass that destroys everything in its path. Some people even interpret this ability to be an attack that erases matter as a hack's ability. Which, if that's the case, might overcome Goku's insane durability. After all, Goku does happen to be made out of matter, just like any of us. Although it's debatable if Purple can even erase matter anyway. This was a very popular argument for a while, but it has lost steam in the latest fight in the manga with Tsukuna getting hit with it more than once and not getting erased. He took damage for sure, but a lot of people have ditched this interpretation of the ability because it seems to be portrayed like any other energy attack. It's really hard to tell, to be honest. Now, in response to Purple, I do just want to say that in the manga version of the Goku Black arc, Goku uses an incomplete version of Hakai, which is basically an ability that utterly destroys someone, both body and soul. Basically, the Hollow Purple but better. So it's hard to count this as an advantage in Gojo's favor when Goku can basically do the same thing. At most, this is a point of contention. Now, if you made it this far in the video, I'm guessing it seems like I think Goku takes the fight. And I do. I think there is a solid argument for why he could potentially handle just about everything Gojo can throw at him. Unlimited Void is a strong argument, though, if he uses it early in the fight. I think that could do something. Everything else, though, is kind of a matter of interpretation. You might have listened to my whole spiel about infinite speed and dividing space and think I'm either coping, looking too deep into it, or just a straight up idiot. And if you think so, then I'd be happy to hear your take on why I'm wrong about that. I personally think it's a solid argument, but not guaranteed. This all being said, if Goku can't get through infinity, you could just take him really out of character and have him blow up the earth that they're on. Both of them need air to breathe, so that would be a tie technically. I don't think infinity protects you from the cold vacuum of space. Aside from that though, at the end of the day, when pitting these two titans of their era against each other, I do think it's very likely that Goku wins. In the quest to answer the question, does he beat Goku though? I, I would have to lean towards no. But there's definitely room for argument, so let me know what you think. If you agree, let me know in the comments. Or maybe you disagree, in which case feel free to call me the worst stuff imaginable. I get it, this power scaling stuff gets serious. But if you did like the video, be sure to like and subscribe, and you can also support the channel by becoming a member. But in the meantime, take care and have a good one.